Congressman Smith indicates there might be some national security concerns with an extended drawing out of this process. Do you all have that concern that there may be some national security vulnerability in not being sworn in, not getting intel or briefings? Without question, I'll let my two colleagues answer as well. There are national security vulnerabilities. This is a dangerous moment for Americans and for the world. It's one of the reasons why the Congress needs to organize. There are public health vulnerabilities. It's one of the reasons why the Congress needs to organize and Republicans need to get their act together. And of course, there are safety vulnerabilities that we should be working on together, dealing with the gun violence epidemic that exists here in the United States of America, building upon the progress of the first gun safety bill that we passed in 30 years in the last Congress. So these are real challenges that the American people are confronting that are being held hostage as a result of unfortunate Republican dysfunction. Yes. It is not only our national security concerns when we cannot organize our committees, when we are not getting the intelligence briefings that we should be able to get, I mean, it is, cert it is just a matter of luck at this point that, that there is not something we miss because of this profound dysfunction in the Republican Party. And we have to look at this for the outrage and the danger that it is. This is more than some internal squabbling over who in the GOP conference likes or doesn't like Kevin McCarthy. This is about your responsibility to organize government. It is fundamental to who we are as members of Congress. And not only at these high levels of national security, we cannot organize our district offices, get our new members doing that critical work of our constituent services, helping serve the people who sent us here on their behalf. Kevin McCarthy's ego and his pursuit of this speakership at all costs is drowning out the voices and the needs of the American people. They say they came here to help fight inflation. They cannot stop fighting among themselves to move us forward. So we are here in a dangerous position. And this is far more than their own rancor within their country. They are imperiling our country as they continue their pursuit for this speakership, putting the American people and our democracy in their rearview mirror. Scott, I said at the top that this was this was dangerous what they're doing. On one of the morning shows, one of the individuals opposed to Kevin McCarthy said it's just it's just a day or two, you know, there's there's no uh, uh, there's nothing to see here yet other Republicans are saying what we're saying, that this is that this is dangerous, that they can't organize. It is. The Democratic Caucus has selected Hakeem to sit at the table of the Gang of Eight and to represent America's interests when it comes to national security. The fact that we can't do that, the fact that members can't get briefings, take an oath, help their constituents, it's dangerous. It'll continue to be dangerous as long as they continue this chaos and, and confusion. The gentlewoman is recognized. 212, 212, 212, 212, 212, 212, and today, 212. House. Two hundred and twelve House Democrats stand united behind our leader because Hakeem Jeffries stands united for the American people. The historic dysfunction that we are seeing, this intra-party fight that the American people have been drawn into is imperiling our national security. It will imperil the ability of this government 
to deliver basic services. It is imperiling our jobs and our responsibility to serve our constituents. But it is also entirely predictable. They're failing to convene Congress today, but for years they have failed to deliver the votes for the American people. When schools and small businesses needed to reopen and the American people wanted vaccines, they said no. When we capped insulin costs for seniors at $35 a month, they said no. When we lowered health care costs and premiums for working families, they said no. When we defended the civil rights of LGBTQ plus Americans, they said no. When we protected lives from senseless gun violence, especially in the wake of the horrors of Buffalo and Uvalde, they said no. When we stood up for women and reproductive freedom, they said no. When we brought manufacturing back to America, they said no. When we answered the urgent call to protect our planet and invest in clean energy and create tens of millions of good paying jobs, they said no. When we said women deserve equal pay for equal work, they said no. When we said that childcare and paid family leave should be available to every worker in this country, to every family, they said no. When we secured the fundamental right to vote for every single American, they said no. When we stood by our veterans and expanded their access to health care, they said no. When we defended our democracy two years ago tomorrow from a tyrannical president following the January 6th insurrection, they said no. House Democrats will stand together. We will stand for the American people. It is our job and our responsibility to elect a speaker who stands with them. And with great pride, I nominate Hakeem Jeffries. Whip, Ms. Clark. The gentlelady from Massachusetts is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the gentleman from Massachusetts for yielding. When Roe v. Wade was overturned, the impact on Americans was swift and devastating. Women were denied health care. Doctors were threatened with criminal charges. Hospitals were forced to put their liability over patients' lives. And as the GOP doubled down on its plan for a national abortion ban, the American people saw it for what it was. Anti-woman, anti-choice, anti-family, and anti-freedom. Kansas, California, Kentucky, Michigan, Montana, Vermont, voters across the country rejected this extremism. And with this anti-freedom agenda exposed, some of my Republican colleagues started to scrub their websites, roll back their rhetoric, and dodge questions on abortion. But here we are again in this rules package. Within days of taking over the House majority, Republicans are pushing legislation to limit women's rights. So let's see where you truly stand. Today, House Democrats offer the Women's Health Protection Act to make abortion access a federal right, no matter your zip code or your income. Do my colleagues across the aisle believe that families in consultation with their doctors, with their faith, with their life circumstances should decide when to have children? Or do my colleagues think that is a decision for Republican politicians? Vote to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land. Vote for freedom. I yield back. Gentleman from Oklahoma. The minority whip, Catherine Clark. The gentle, gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Thank you uh, to the gentlelady from Pennsylvania for yielding. 
The Speaker of the House wrote this week that removing Democrats from their committees was motivated by integrity. Integrity? Is that the quality of honesty and acting with moral principle? There is no integrity here. Congresswoman Omar is a committed, hardworking, and highly valued member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. A refugee and a survivor of war, she knows firsthand how much is at stake in its work. It is too serious of a subject to be subjected to partisan games by the Republican majority. But that's how the GOP has decided to govern. Not with solutions, but with political stunts. How can my colleagues across the aisle talk about integrity and honor as they empower the most extreme voices in their party, as they claim due process has been added in when there is none, as they promote conspiracy theories? Bart? Can I get through 30 seconds? I, hear, I hereby yield 30 seconds. As yield. they stack some of our most critical committees with election deniers. It is too late to inject integrity into the damn process, but we as members can inject our own by voting no on this resolution. Gen gentlewoman has, gentlewoman yields back. The purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for the purpose of announcing the schedule for next week. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House will meet next Monday at 12 noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for legislative business at 9 p.m. The House and Senate will assemble for a joint session to receive President Biden's address on the State of the Union. Members should be seated in the House chamber by 8.25 p.m. On Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business. And we will be considering several bills under suspension of the rules during the week. The complete list of suspension bills has been posted on the clerk's website. Next week, the House is expected to consider a number of bills under rules, H.R. Uh, 185, to terminate the requirement imposed by the director of CMS for proof of COVID-19 vaccination for foreign travelers and for other purposes. H.R. 185 rescinds the Biden administration's vaccine requirement on travelers who are coming to visit the United States. The House is also expected to consider H.J. Res 26, disapproving the District of Columbia's City Council Revised Criminal Code Act of 2021. H.J. Uh, Res 26 makes it clear that Congress does not approve of the City Council's radical decision to reduce penalties for a variety of crimes, including many violent crimes. Finally, we expect to consider H.J. Res 24, disapproving the action of the District of Columbia's City Council in approving the Local Resident Voting Rights Amendment Act of 2022. Uh, what this resolution would do is re reverse the decision by the D.C. Council that would allow illegal aliens to vote. As we all know, our southern border has been wide open under President Biden. Millions of people have come into our country illegally. And he continues to keep that border open. We've talked about bringing legislation to this floor, which we're working on in committee, to secure America's border. But in the meantime, the idea that allowing people that are here illegally to vote here uh, not only undermines one of our most sacred rights in the United States, but it also sends the wrong message to those who are seeking to come into our country illegally. We need President Biden to close the southern border, secure the southern border, get back to a legal process of immigration. That's what H.J. Res 24 would do. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I would be happy to yield to my friend, the new majority, the minority whip of the House from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. 
I thank the gentleman, and uh, it is my privilege to join my first colloquy, uh, to stand here on behalf of the Democratic Caucus, and it is a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for the small promotion, however brief. And uh, I really do appreciate the insight into the week of head, although it does seem to have a very local flavor to it. And I have to express my dismay that once again, the House Republican majority is putting forward an agenda designed to score points rather than address the very real challenges faced by Americans. Next week, President Biden will return to this chamber for the State of the Union. And under his leadership, House Democrats have lowered costs, We've created great paying union jobs, and we have made communities safer. We've spurred a period of renewed opportunity. 10.7 million new jobs, the lowest unemployment rate in half a century, and wage growth that is outpacing inflation. But that work has seemed to have ground to a halt. Here's what we've seen from the majority over the last month. The first bill of the 118th Congress was a bill that helps billionaires dodge their taxes and added $114 billion to the deficit. They continued their assault on reproductive freedom and are threatening economic disaster in order to cut Social Security and Medicare and filling our schedule with hollow symbolic stunts. The American people are in the GOP's rearview mirror. It's politics over people, plain and simple. And our constituents and the American people are seeing this. A recent national poll found that 73% of Americans say House Republicans haven't paid enough attention to the country's most important problems. The American people don't see themselves in the Republican agenda. And I would ask the majority leader, what does he say to them? Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding back. And what I would first th say to the American people is thank you for giving the Republicans the House majority to finally stop this mad rush towards socialism that we see in the last two years by the Biden administration. The taxing, the spending, the out of control policies that have led our country into one of the worst economic times we've ever seen. Inflation through the roof to the point where families can't even afford to put gasoline in their car. Inflation through the roof to the point where families can't even go to the grocery store and buy all the things that they would want. Uh, that's what the American people surely were fed up with and the good news is, as I thank them for giving the Republicans the majority, which they did in the last election, Republicans have already gone to work delivering for those families. We've actually brought, it's interesting, you know, as the gentlelady talks about scoring points, we've scored a number of points for those American people to the point where we've actually had a number of Democrats vote with us. Um, the bills that were called partisan just two weeks ago, we brought a bill to the floor to say, on energy, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is supposed to be America's security blanket in case that there's some major disruption with American energy supply. And I'm not talking about the disruption we've seen from, from President Biden's attack on American energy, which has been so severe that it's made our country dependent on foreign nations again, which is unconscionable when we can produce our own energy cleaner, better than anybody else in the world. But it said, if you're going to raid, Mr. President, that strategic petroleum reserve, you surely can't do it to sell it to China. And it was called partisan when we filed it. What's interesting is a majority of Democrats actually voted for that legislation, and it's now over in the Senate, and I hope it ends up on President Biden's desk. And I hope he signs it, but if he vetoes it, there was a veto-proof majority that passed that bill. We just brought a piece of legislation a few minutes ago onto the floor to reject the ills of socialism not just what we're seeing here in the United States, socialist movement that's been damaging to our economy, but all throughout time, so many examples of socialist dictators killing millions and millions of people. I'm glad to say a majority of Democrats joined with us to vote for that bill. Still a little bit shocking that 86 Democrats were not willing to stand up against the ills of socialism, uh, and that, that I would consider an extreme position 
uh, but clearly there, there's still work to be done, and the American people, I'm sure, will continue to engage their members of Congress on those issues. But we're going to continue to move policies to help families who are struggling. Energy policies, obviously, and there's more to come on that. The Energy and Commerce Committee just got constituted. They're working now on a good energy security package. The Natural Resources Committee and Transportation Committee are doing the same thing. Um, I had mentioned to the gentlelady earlier on the border, as we would like to see real security from our southern border. I hope President Biden, when he's speaking from the podium here in just a few days, will address that problem. More people have come into our country illegally under President Biden's watch than the entire population of the state of New Mexico. And where it's caused real damage is more than 100,000 young kids. Our young kids have died because of drug overdoses from drugs like fentanyl because the drug cartels of Mexico now have operational control of America's southern border. That's disgraceful. That's all brought on by President Biden's policies. He could end those today through executive action, reverse the things that he did that created the problem. He won't do that. So I do think it's important that this Congress take that action. We still wait for the president to do it on his own, but we're not going to stand by. We will take our own action and show the country how we can get a secure southern border. I hope that would be a bipartisan vote when we bring that to the floor. The 87,000 IRS agents, uh, I don't know of any member of Congress, I'd love to hear from any of them, who've gotten phone calls from their constituents saying, please double the size of the IRS. Now, what they have said is, please get federal employees back to work, because some people, I've got constituents that have been waiting two years for their tax return, and yet you've still got about half of the federal workforce that's working remotely, not coming into work. I've got veterans who call my office all the time who can't get their benefits that they earned. They showed up for work, by the way. They showed up and said, I'm going to go defend the rights of this country. And some of them got injured. Some of them are trying to get their benefits today and can't because some of those people working, getting their full salary uh, at the VA are not showing up for work. Uh, people that are waiting for passports to go visit loved ones overseas can't get their passports processed because some federal employees feel they should get their full salary but not show up for work. And so we brought a bill this week to say you should show up for work seems pretty basic. It's unfortunate that there were less than a handful of Democrats that joined with us to do that. So we're addressing the needs of those families who are struggling. Some of those votes have been bipartisan, some haven't, but we're going to continue to address them because they're bipartisan issues for America, even if they're not bipartisan in this chamber, and hopefully that improves over time, and I'd be happy to yield to the gentlelady. I thank the gentleman. I am hearing the exact same rhetoric, the exact same political posturing that I've heard for the last month. It doesn't give the American people any reason to think the GOP's priorities are going to focus on them. Let's just look at what we were able to do as Democrats without a single Republican vote in the Inflation Reduction Act true cost savings that went and started to go into effect this past month. We delivered a historic victory for seniors. We capped out-of-pocket drug costs at $2,000 a year. We limited insulin co-pays to $35 a month. We empowered Medicare to negotiate drug prices, and we punished drug companies for predatory price hikes. Once again, every single Republican in the House voted against lowering seniors' pharmacy bills, lowering these costs for our Americans. A Republican member even asked, how are we going to undo that when we get into the majority? And here we are. The House Republicans' campaign platform took direct aim at this historic legislation. So we can vote on sham bills. We can look at what the D.C. City Council is doing. That is up to the majority to set that agenda. Our agenda is going to remain on lowering costs for Americans that the issues they talk around their kitchen tables and worry about are the issues we are going to remain focused on. And I would ask the majority leader, will you commit to defending these cost savings 
these true victories for our seniors. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding. And the good news is we not only have already brought some bills to achieve cost savings, we're going to continue to bring bills to achieve cost savings. And one example, the gentlelady referred to a piece of legislation that deals with drug prices. And it was failed to mention that part of what that bill did was limit about 40% of the life-saving drugs uh, to come to market. We're already seeing right now a reduction in R&D and drugs being developed to cure new diseases because many of those countries that have government fixed pricing also don't have many of the life-saving drugs that America has because of that very policy. And so I'm curious to see which life-saving drugs they don't want to have on the market in America anymore, but you can go to Canada, you can go to France and see a long list, unfortunately, of drugs that you can't get in those countries that you can get in America that save lives every day. But that bill also raised taxes to the tune of over a trillion dollars on Americans. It raised spending to the tune of over a trillion dollars in America. That is increased inflation. The biggest concern I hear from families who want cost savings is stop the mad spending in Washington. That has not only caused them to have to pay more for everything they buy, it's literally taken a paycheck uh, a year, at least one month's pay a year out of their pockets because of all the spending we've seen in the last two years in Washington. So just stopping the spending, but also trying to get and rein in that. In fact, we brought a bill this week, uh, you know, we could talk about DC, we can talk about other places, but all across America, most Americans are saying, let's get back to our lives. Let's end this COVID emergency. And so we announced last week that we were gonna bring a bill during this week to end the COVID emergency. What was interesting was after we took the lead, President Biden himself actually acknowledged that it does need to end. Now he said he wants to wait until May to do it. And what's interesting about waiting until May is it allows the federal government to continue spending billions and billions of dollars under the guise of COVID on things that have absolutely nothing to do with COVID, like paying people not to work. Millions of people today are able-bodied, fully capable of working, and because of the waiving of things like welfare to work requirements, where people can right now get $25,000, $35,000 a year to sit at home and not work. Well, you know what that does? And we want to reverse that policy. If somebody's capable of working, they should be working. We believe in a safe social safety net for people. If somebody comes on hard times, that's why you have programs there. Uh, we are in America. If you want to stay at home and not work, that's your right. Just don't ask that hardworking taxpayer, the single mom who's working two jobs to pay for you to stay at home. What's even bigger in what President Biden has done by having these policies in place that pay millions of people to stay at home at work, you know what that does? That policy by President Biden undermines Social Security because those millions of people who our seniors are counting on to be in the workforce who are fully capable being in the workforce, paying into Social Security so that those who work their whole lives and earn that benefit can have and have a confidence that it'll be there for them. When you have millions of people being paid by the federal government to stay home, of course it adds trillions to our deficit, but it also takes billions of dollars out of Social Security that we want to put back in. We want to shore up Social Security, but President Biden has undermined it with these policies that pay people not to work. So our bill said, let's end that immediately. Let's get those people back to work who are fully capable of working. Let's shore up Social Security immediately. We shouldn't have to wait more months and months like President Biden said he would want to do. And of course, if we didn't file that bill, he probably never would have wanted to end that emergency. So Hopefully, as we continue to lead, we'll see the president follow along. We welcome him to join us in saving this country and getting the country back on track. So we will continue to bring bills to address those many problems our country's facing. I yield back. I, I have to say I'm disappointed that it seemed like a simple question. Would you support the, the cap on insulin at $35 a month when one in four Americans with diabetes didn't take their medication because they simply couldn't afford them. But if the gentleman wants to talk about Social Security, I welcome that discussion. Um, it is clear that Speaker McCarthy, who was just at the White House yesterday, was talking with the president who underlined the urgency of responsibly raising the debt ceiling, something that Republicans did three times 
under President Trump. But instead, the majority seems more than ready to hold our economy hostage, to risk a global recession, to risk the full faith and credit of the United States, to gut those very programs, Social Security, Medicare, and to put more money in the pockets of the rich. They are using this debt ceiling as a smokescreen. So let's get the facts straight. This is not about new spending. This is about money we already owe. And if we want to go back to a place where Donald Trump really excelled, it was in driving up the deficit. Eight trillion dollars in four years under the Trump administration. That is a quarter of our entire debt ceiling. And again, when Donald Trump was in office, spiking our debt ceiling, the debt ceiling, uh, the deficit, the debt ceiling was raised three times without fanfare. Who benefits from that borrowing? The rich, the very rich, and the ultra rich. Who do you think, if we don't pay this debt ceiling, is going to take over those payments? Apparently, you think it should be our seniors on Medicare and Social Security, families who are looking for affordable housing, our veterans, our children, our planet. You don't have to take it from me. The majority has made their position perfectly clear. One Republican member said the debt ceiling is an obvious leverage point. Another said the focus of budget cuts has got to be on entitlements. The Republicans' budget committee chair has called for eligibility reforms to Social Security and Medicare. The Republican study committee has openly proposed raising the retirement age to 70, handing social security accounts over to Wall Street, transitioning Medicare to a voucher system. All the while, when they actually are taking action, we're back to the rich, the very rich, and the super rich. First bill passed, adding to the deficit so that billionaires and the very wealthy can afford can avoid paying the taxes that we ask our teachers, our firefighters, our nurses to pay. And what's more, what's waiting on the agenda is a proposal to do away with the IRS. Let's do away with income tax and go to a system of a 30% sales tax. This would be devastating to families at home who are trying to put food on their table, a roof over their families, and have a basic quality of life. So I ask the majority leader, do you agree with your colleagues, or will you join Democrats and keep our seniors and everyday Americans off the chopping block? I thank the gentlelady from yielding. And I earlier pointed out, I reject what President Biden did to undermine Social Security. So what we're going to be doing, and Speaker McCarthy brought this up to President Biden yesterday in talking about the debt ceiling, because frankly, I think most Americans have been hungry for us here in Washington to have the same adult conversation that they've been having at their kitchen tables for years. And that is how we can actually get spending under control in Washington. And so we've talked about the problems of paying people not to work, it not only adds to our deficit and debt, it also undermines Social Security. So let's get people back to work who are fully able-bodied. But why don't we talk about the nation's credit card? The debt ceiling is a symptom of Washington's spending problem. And so we are approaching in June, according to Treasury, the end of extraordinary measures where the nation would exceed its debt limit. And what that means for a family is Families have credit cards. The credit card has a limit. It's a maximum amount you can spend. Now, many families would not like to spend up to that limit. Some like to pay their credit card off fully at the end of the month. Many don't have that luxury, and so they watch what the maximum is so that they know, okay, if I've got $300 before I hit it, I'm not going to spend $300 because then the card will be declined. Well, if you max out the card, which President Biden has done with his last two years, $6 trillion minimum, 
Those are the conservative estimates. Some estimates go as high as $10 trillion that President Biden has racked up on the nation's credit card. So the $31.3 trillion maximum on the nation's credit card has been hit by President Biden and the Democrat majority spending the last two years. Interestingly, when they were doing that spending, they didn't account for raising the cap on spending when they were spending the money. They pushed that off on us. And so now we have to confront this problem that they created. And so the conversation really should be focused on how we stop this from happening, how we stop maxing out the nation's credit card. Because if a family maxed out their credit card, of course they would pay the minimum payment. Of course they would pay the must-dos. Social Security, again, Speaker McCarthy has made it very clear, we are fully committed to supporting Social Security and those promises that have been made. Why is it that President Biden, the first thing he threatens is Social Security? A dollar's coming into the federal government. A dollar 29 is going out. That's the spending problem. If you really want to break it down to raw numbers, for every dollar the federal government takes in, it spends a dollar 29. Very few families sustain themselves on that kind of trajectory. So what we are saying is, why don't we try to figure out Republicans and Democrats, and by the way, this shouldn't be a partisan exercise. Both sides should want to say, if a dollar's coming in, how do we make sure that only a dollar goes out? That's not where we are today. So let's have that conversation. It's a responsible conversation to have. But in the meantime, let's make sure we're paying our debts and talking about how we can make reforms so we don't keep maxing out the nation's credit card. That's what this debt ceiling discussion is about, because if we just give the president a blank check, which he asked for, and he's not going to get, nobody should just get a blank check. Give me more money so they can just go spend more money. That's not responsible. Let's figure out how we can stop the federal government from continuing to max out the nation's credit card. No better time to have that discussion than after President Biden has maxed out the nation's credit card. So we'll have that conversation, and I think we can get to an agreement where both sides come together and say this is a problem we need to tackle together. Previous presidents have done that, Republican and Democrat, working with Congresses of the other party. I think we can have that conversation, and again, I think most of America has been saying it's about time Washington finally starts having that conversation because families have been having that conversation at their kitchen tables for decades and generations, and I'd yield. Uh, I thank the majority leader, um, but I have to disagree. Um, I think the majority is well aware that there is a big difference between our responsibilities around the debt ceiling and spending discussions. And what we have seen be brought together by all the quotes from Republicans laying out that this is their leverage point to cut spending for the basics for the American people. That are, those are your words, not the words of Democrats or President Biden. And I would completely disagree with this idea that maintaining our full faith and credit for things that we have already agreed on, that is not a blank check. That is not something that benefits President Biden. That is basic fiscal responsibility. And what we have here is a case of hostage taking. The willingness to risk global economic destruction, to put the full faith and credit of the United States in jeopardy, to be able to reduce investments we've made in the American people. What is it you would like to reduce? There is nothing we hear. And when we point out the majority's own words that it is entitlements we're coming after, now we're saying well, that's, that's not our goal. But let's look at what happened under our last Republican administration. Donald Trump tacked nearly $8 trillion onto our deficit. If that had not occurred, we would not even be at our debt ceiling right now. That would be coming in several years. And eight trillion on that deficit is a quarter of everything we owe. And when that was occurring, when the spending was going to the very wealthiest of Americans, when this 
when my colleagues were last in the majority and Donald Trump would sign their bills, there was no mention of the debt ceiling. But now that we need to protect our seniors, those who are hungry in our communities, those who are still struggling to find health insurance, those who are needing to access security in their communities to find affordable housing, the investments that we're making in fighting climate change, building resiliency, and protecting our planet, when those things that don't affect the very wealthy and privileged, those are the things we're willing to put on the chopping block and use the full faith and credit of the United States as leverage that is a disservice to the American people and is the reason we are seeing polls like I previously cited. The American people see they are not a part of the Republican agenda. This is about stunts and it is about building the economy that works only for the very wealthy in this country. I would ask that the Republican uh, majority leader look beyond the constituencies of the very wealthy. And I hope that you will find in your agenda in the coming weeks, room for our seniors, room for our families, room for joining us in putting people over politics, making sure that we are working, continuing the work that we started in rebuilding our infrastructure, making an investment in jobs. We've created over a million jobs in the infrastructure bill every single year for the next 10 years. Those projects are going to be rolling out across this country. We've seen it already uh, with the president's trip to Cincinnati to make sure that we are not only rebuilding our roads and bridges and investing in the American people, but expanding broadband, creating great paying jobs, creating opportunity to help the American people. Sham bills, uh, using our full faith and credit, using the debt ceiling to continue to rig the system for the very wealthiest Americans, that's not what we're about. And I hope that we are going to begin to see an agenda from the GOP that has a glimmer of the American family reflected in it. General Lady, yield on that? I do. Thank you, because I appreciate you bringing up a number of the constituencies that we need to fight to help. Let's start with the people that have been struggling the most, the lower and middle income families. They've been struggling the most in the last two years. They thrived like never before during those Trump years that are being decried by the left. And why did we see such growth from lower and middle income families into the middle class, into higher income categories? Because we actually cut taxes so that we could be competitive as a nation again and create millions of jobs. We actually created millions of jobs by cutting taxes and making our country competitive and not keeping money in Washington, but actually freeing up power so that people could control their own destiny again. And those people did take control of their own destiny. Uh, again, we were losing our middle class during the Obama years. We were seeing great American companies leave America. You could get the list of them. And it's a long list, unfortunately. And we said, let's reverse that. Let's fight for those forgotten men and women. The millionaires and billionaires have their attorneys and their accountants and all the folks on the left who took care of those millionaires and billionaires, how about we start fighting for those people that had been left behind because they were being left behind. And so we said, let's make a tax code that's competitive for them. And if you go back and look, and the good news is there's real data now. You don't have to wonder about it. You know, you can throw away the talking points about the rich that are always thrown out there. The income groups that benefited the most from those tax cuts were the lower and middle income groups and millions of people became part of the middle class who were left behind. Those are the facts. The data is out there. Some people are angry about that because they still wanna live in this false universe where they just decry tax cuts because that takes power away from Washington. And I think that's what scares the left so much is when they see people being empowered again to be free to control their own destiny, not bureaucrats and autocrats in Washington taking their money and then telling them what they can get back. 
telling them how high they can go. How about you break the ceilings and just let people go out and succeed and give them the tools to do it. And if you want to go out and work and, and succeed and achieve the American dream, it's there for everybody. And we restored that again. By the way, some of those tax cuts expire. I hope the gentlelady and their side will join with us in continuing to keep that tax structure in place so those middle income folks can continue to grow and thrive, but also for our seniors. And this is where the president, I think, is looking for ideas on how we can start living within our means again. And, and as I will refresh, as, as the gentlelady talked about spending that's already been done and leverage and full faith and credit of the United States, none of that would even be a discussion point today if as the Democrats, when they had the House, Senate, and White House for two years and spent over $6 trillion of money we don't have, if they also would have addressed the debt ceiling at that time, we wouldn't be standing in this spot. We literally just took the majority weeks ago and the nation's already hit its debt ceiling because of the spending done, not by President Trump. He actually addressed the debt ceiling as we were putting policies in place that grew our economy and created a middle class again. That was already done. The last two years, over $6 trillion in spending, but no time seemed to be available to address the debt ceiling. So here we are. And we're willing to have a discussion about how to get control over spending, but there are really good ideas. And in fact, many of these ideas will strengthen Social Security for our seniors. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about getting people that are being paid not to work back into the workforce. That will strengthen Social Security. But how about we restore some of the work requirements that used to be there? And this goes back to Bill Clinton, a Democrat, who signed those work requirements. And again, it helped get more people into the workforce, helped give them a chance to achieve the American dream, but it also strengthened Social Security. When the government's paying people not to work, they're not paying into Social Security. That undermines the program. We should be wanting to strengthen it. By the way, there's also long lists, and believe me, we're going to be getting these lists out, and I hope Democrats will go down with this menu and say, okay, we agree. Paying people tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars to get tax credits who don't even have Social Security numbers, who don't even live in America. If, if a tax credit is there, it's there for people who pay taxes, not for people who manipulate the system because for whatever reason this administration won't even verify a Social Security number. Just doing that verification would save tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars. We're talking about real money. Those things could all help. And these aren't cuts to things, these are savings uh, for fraud. Real fraud, waste, and abuse that equals hundreds of billions of dollars. And we've been outlining these things. I haven't found any takers yet, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I think eventually we will get a lot of takers on the other side who will recognize this is something we all need to come together and do because there's no reason that the families who are hard, working hard should be paying for somebody else to cheat the system. And there's many, many examples. We'll continue to highlight them, and we'll actually bring bills to address those exact problems. And all of that should be a part of this discussion so we don't keep maxing out the nation's credit card. But again, nobody just says here, if their kids maxed out the card, they're not just going to give them a new card and say, go max out the next one. They're going to sit down and have an adult conversation about how you don't put the country in this situation again. I'd yield. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Let's go over the basic facts here just briefly once again. What the House GOP did fight for in 2017 was a $2 trillion in tax giveaways for our largest corporations and for the wealthy, because that's who they work for, the rich, the very rich, and the super rich. And under the Trump administration, we had record job loss of 3 million jobs. So I, I am prepared to close if, if you are. And I, and I would just say on that, you can go look at the tax cuts. After those taxes were cut, the federal government took in more money than it's ever done in the history of the country because more people were working and more lower and middle income people were making higher wages lifting those at the bottom into the middle class, which was evaporating under the Obama years. So the data is very clear on that. And those tax cuts actually brought more money in to the federal treasury. Uh, anybody wants to dispute it, I challenge them to go to President Biden's treasury website and find the numbers because they're there. I'd yield back. 
The numbers are there. $8 trillion in deficit under the Trump administration. Direct correlation to a tax policy that only benefits the very wealthy. But I would like to, to close if the gentleman uh, yields for that. Happy and to I, yield for that. I thank him for joining me today. I look forward to many more conversations to come. In the meantime, our caucus is thrilled to welcome the president back to this chamber on Tuesday for a State of the Union address. And we hope the majority will draw some inspiration and work with us in service of the people who sent us here. Let's put people over politics, put them back on the table here in Congress. And with that, I yield back. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding and uh, enjoyed our first of many of these colloquies. And uh, as we look towards hearing from the president, which we welcome together into this chamber, I look forward to working with the president to address these problems our country's facing so we can get the country back on track and then focus on, on the challenges ahead. There will be many more conversations we will have. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields. I recognize the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ahead of Trans Day of Visibility, I rise in honor of a community that is being forced to fight for its very existence. I rise in honor of trans voices that deserve to be heard, not silenced, and not criminalized. I rise in honor of trans joy that deserves to be celebrated, not eradicated. I rise with unconditional love for my trans daughter, Riley, and I rise in solidarity with every trans American seeking nothing less than their inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. To stand in the way of that right is to stand against our most basic American values. But that's exactly what mega extremists are doing across this country, on school boards, in state capitals, here in the halls of Congress. Elected officials are using their power to undermine the freedoms and human dignity of trans Americans. And they're waging an especially vicious crusade on our kids. These attacks make me all the more grateful for the unconditional love that Mimi and Joe LeMay of Massachusetts have for their son, Jacob. Mimi and Joe have faced vitriol and cruelty from right-wing extremists, all because they heard, accepted, and embraced Jacob when he told them he's a boy. A few years ago, Mimi shared a letter she wrote to her son, and I'd like to offer a few of her moving words. You have, at the age of nine years, accomplished what many adults couldn't in a lifetime. In your courageous visibility, you have changed the course of your own history. You have turned strangers into allies and allies into advocates. Layered in my pride is my concern for you. I know your strength, but I also know how determined the forces are that have pitted themselves against you. The politicians and preachers who would rather see you languish in a dark closet than watch you engage the world as you do, cultivating joy and love wherever you go. Madam Speaker, Jacob's courage demonstrates a profound strength. Let's show that strength the respect it demands. Let's reject the forces of opposition and bigotry. Let's celebrate the bravery and beauty of our trans community. Let's follow Jacob's example and cultivate joy and love wherever we go. I yield back. Good morning. The attack in Nashville marked the 130th mass shooting of the year. That's not just a tragedy, it's a choice. It's a choice that puts guns over our children. As moms and elected officials, we share a fundamental responsibility to keep our children safe. 
Yet before the families of Nashville victims could even bury their loved ones, their nine-year-old children, we heard the same tired excuses for GOP inaction. If you are pri prioritizing the sale of AR-15s over the lives of our children, if you are putting the demands of the gun lobby over the safety of our families, if you are trying to hide behind responsible gun owners rather than act to keep dangerous people from mowing down our kids, then what are you doing in Congress? House Democrats will not allow this vile cynicism to pass for solutions. The least the MAGA majority can do is have the courage to show parents where they stand. Give us a vote on the assault weapons. Give us a vote on background checks. Bring it to the floor. Put yourself on record. Show the American people your priorities. Is it our kids or is it guns? And now it is my privilege to yield to a colleague who's always made her priorities crystal clear. An unrivaled champion for gun safety, a voice for parents across this country, Congresswoman Lucy McBath. Is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the ranking member. I rise in opposition to the majority's Polluters Over People Act, a massive handout to some of the world's most profitable and most powerful corporations, a big oil giveaway that would hike the deficit instead of helping families, instead of protecting our planet, instead of lowering costs for consumers and slashing energy bills. Republicans seem to have just one priority, and that's helping the rich get richer. Through price gouging and war profiteering, big oil has doubled their profits to record level. They're hoarding millions of acres of our public land, and they're using these unprecedented resources to line their pockets. Exxon just announced a $35 billion in stock buybacks. Chevron's shareholders are pocketing $75 billion. And yet, what's the Republican plan? triple down on allegiance to big oil, give away more federal land, invite more offshore drilling, unleash more pollution into our water and our air and our land, and leave the taxpayers footing the bill. Climate change is here. We don't have time to wait. Americans know that securing our future means investing in clean energy. Families know their health depends on it. Economists know our prosperity depends on it. And the Pentagon knows our national security depends on it. It's only MAGA Republicans who don't understand our future depends on a thriving, clean energy economy. Last year, we proudly enacted the largest climate investor investment in history. And now we're proudly voting no on the Polluters Over Peoples Act. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to now yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, the Democratic Whip, uh, Ms. Clark. The gentlelady is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Listen, I'm from Boston. We want to talk about sports. I'm all in. If we want to talk about equality for women and girls, if we want to talk about Title IX and ensuring fairness in sports, sign me up. And as, as far as kids and sports go, as a mom of three, I can't tell you how many hours I have spent cheering on my kids. It's lacrosse, basketball, uh, baseball, it has been soccer, rugby, cross country, track. Um, we have seen in my family championship teams through t-ball teams where our entire goal was to just get the outfield to stop digging for worms. Um, but all of this is about 
kids and their experience about learning, growing, forming friendships, knowing what it means to work hard, to practice, to see results, to be a team. So I was very interested when this bill came, uh, uh, was filed, to see what it was. What was the problem that the NCAA, that in Massachusetts and across this country, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association and its counterparts around the country, what the Olympics, the International um, Track and Field Association, what they were missing. And I read this bill, and what they're missing is nothing. This is not a problem in our communities, on our sports field, for our children. And I think it was articulated so well by the Republican governor of Utah when he pointed out numbers that were important to his decision to veto a similar bill that 75,000 kids played high school sports in his state. Just four of them are trans kids. One of them plays girls sports. And 86% of our trans youth will have suicidal ideation and 56% will attempt suicide. What are we doing here? What are we doing here as members of Congress Whereas the governor said, we are expending so much fear and division on so few, on kids. Think about what we are doing as members of the United States House of Representatives. I keep thinking about the mom who told me about her rural community where her concern was the grief because they were losing their children, losing them because there wasn't economic opportunity for them in their hometown, and losing them because they were dying of opioid overdoses. Gentlewoman's time has expired. I have 10 seconds. I yield additional 10 seconds. Gentlelady's recognized. So let's think about this. We need to be working on the issues that matter to families and kids and to make these children, these children responsible for all of that, to hold them to incite fear and discrimination and hatred, you should General hang your heads time in has shame. Expired. Party, Catherine Clark. General lady from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts for yielding. I rise in strong opposition to this reckless default on America Act. I've got to say, I see why the Republicans put this together in the dead of night. I wouldn't want Americans to see this plan either. It's the same GOP playbook. Give more to the rich and elite, stick hardworking Americans with the bill, and threaten economic disaster if we don't go along. So why exactly is the GOP endangering American livelihoods? So they can help a few rich friends dodge their taxes. And what's the cost to the American people? Here's just a few. 2,400 Border Patrol agents off the job, 300,000 kids out of childcare, 400,000 families evicted from their homes, a million seniors kicked off of Meals on Wheels, $2 billion taken away from veterans health care. That is 30 million doctors' appointments stolen from veterans. It is disgraceful. Mr. Speaker, there is one responsible path forward, a clean, unconditional vote to avoid default, something the GOP did three times under Donald Trump. As Trump put it himself, we cannot use the debt ceiling to negotiate. Stop the madness, deliver a resounding no vote on this dangerous piece of political theater. I yield back. <laughs> Without objection. Speaker, as we all know, the House has already voted to address the debt ceiling. In fact, on April 26th, the House is not in order. Madam Speaker, on April 26th, 
this House passed the Limit, Save, and Grow Act. Well, should I say, should I say some of this House, but a majority of this House passed a bill to address not only the debt ceiling, but also the spending problem in Washington that has brought us to this point. Now, I'll also say, Madam Speaker, that for more than four weeks, the Senate has not even taken up action on that bill. In fact, the Senate's not even in session today or this week. With that said, Madam Speaker, the House is scheduled to take its last votes. The House will be in order. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Following tomorrow's votes, if some new agreement is reached between President Biden and Speaker McCarthy, members will receive 24 hours notice in the event we need to return to Washington for any additional votes either over the weekend or next week. Additionally, we will allow all members to have 72 hours to review any such legislative text that may become, come before us relating to the debt ceiling before final passage of that bill. <laughs> Does the gentlelady ask to yield? Thank you for yielding to my colleague. I, I don't know how my colleagues across the aisle who voted for the Default on America Act are going to look our veterans in the eye this Memorial Day. You, you have presented our country with an impossible choice, devastating cuts or devastating default. Hungry families or homeless seniors? Kids without classrooms or parents without jobs? Empty VA clinics? Are, empty VA clinics or empty savings account? And now you're sending us home with no resolution. That's the plan, to default, to run out the clock. Well, I have some good news for you. 213. Every single member of the Democratic caucus has signed the discharge petition. So before you go home, before you go home, it only takes five patriots, five patriots to join us in the fight for the American people. Join us, sign the petition, stay here and fight for American families, fight for their American security. I yield back. Reclaiming my time, Madam Speaker. The House will be in order. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Maybe my colleagues on the other side are having buyer's remorse, or should I say voter's remorse, that every single one of them voted against addressing the debt ceiling over a month ago when we brought that bill to the floor. Now, Madam Speaker, there is a remedy. If anyone in this chamber, including my friends on the other side, would like to see this problem addressed, they should go over to the Senate side, or frankly, there's no one there. They should get on the phone and call the Democrat senators who run the Senate and chose to be out this whole week because they took this so seriously, or call the White House and ask the President why he took 97 days off after the first meeting with Speaker McCarthy when the Speaker was ready to negotiate. We're still here. We have done our job. We have acted. We are, in fact, the only body in this town who has actually taken steps to address the debt ceiling and the spending problem in Washington. I would encourage the Senate to take up the bill. I would encourage the President to get engaged and address this problem, but we already have. The votes are on the board. 
I order. ask that the House be in order and there be some decorum on the other side. The members are reminded to abide by decorum of the House. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And while some in this town might be interested in theatrics, House Republicans took action. We passed a bill to address the problem. It's time for my friends on the other side to start doing their job. Call the Senate back in to take up the bill. If they don't like it, they can amend it. That is part of the legislative process. Let's get our jobs done. We've done ours. They need to do theirs. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Boss, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1669 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title. Union Calendar Number 48, H.R. 1669, a bill to amend Title 38, United States Code, to make permanent the high-technology pilot program of the Department of Veterans Affairs and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. Massachusetts, the whip of the Democratic Party, uh, Whip Clark. Gentlelady from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ever since the Minutemen gathered in Lexington, America's armed forces have been guardians of freedom. Generations of heroes have signed up for a singular cause, preserving liberty for all. And regardless of party or politics, the houses come together every year to put our national security and our military families first, until now. This year, the MAGA majority is using our national defense bill to get one step closer to the only thing they really care about, a nationwide abortion ban. Mr. Speaker, Americans are already paying the price for Republicans' extremism. Americans like Amanda Zorowski, who rushed to the hospital last year after suffering a miscarriage. Amanda needed an abortion procedure to prevent a deadly infection, but her doctor sent her home, banned under Texas law from providing the care she needed. So she waited, mourning her daughter, that she had lost until she went into septic shock, ended up in the ICU for three days and almost lost her life. Now MAGA Republicans are aiming the same dangerous extremism at our troops. They want the same control over the health, body, and lives of America's service members and their families. That's not freedom, that's not patriotism, that's not national security, that's tyranny. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members are advised that votes are no longer expected in the House tomorrow. Last votes, we still have more work to do, don't celebrate too early. Uh, last votes for the week and the month are expected now at approximately 2.50 today, so we will have one more vote series today, uh, then we will be finished uh, for the August work period, I'll remind the House that just during this month, this House has completed the National Defense Authorization Act, the FAA Reauthorization Act, 
the Schools No Shelter Act, and we just passed, of course, the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Act to make sure that our veterans, to make sure that we fully fund health care for our veterans, we support suicide prevention, and we also fund housing and other services for our men and women in uniform who keep us safe. Uh, with that, I would be happy to yield to uh, the Democrat whip, Ms. Clark. Thank you. I appreciate the leader for, for yielding. I think we have very different definitions of success for the American people. As Democrats, we have been focused and have been successful in growing our economy by growing the middle class, lowering health care costs, making sure that we are addressing climate change, having safer communities. And now, the Republican conference is saying they are sending us home for six weeks without funding the government, that we have one bill one bill out of 12 completed because extremists are holding your conference hostage. And that's not the full story. The extremists are holding the American people hostage. We will have 12 days, 12 days when we return to fund the government, to live up to the job the American people sent us here to do. This is a reckless march to a MAGA shutdown. And for what? In pursuit of a national abortion ban? Is that what we are doing here? The American people see through this. They know who is fighting for them, fighting for solutions. This your time is coming. The American people are watching. They are going to demand accountability. We should be staying here, completing these appropriation bill, stripping out the toxic, divisive, bigoted riders that have been put on these bills and get back to work for freedom and for our economy and the American family. I yield back. House to be in order. The gentleman from Louisiana is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would agree with the gentlelady on one thing that she just said, the American people are watching. And what the American people just watched is every single Democrat vote against funding veterans benefits. Every single one. But thank goodness this Republican majority stood together and put the votes on the board, $138 billion, so our veterans will get the benefits that they deserve and earn. And if the Democrats are going to be extreme and walk away from that responsibility, we will be here standing to make the call, to make the tough votes, to get that work done as the Appropriations Committee has done over and over again on bills that in committee Democrats have walked away from over and over again. So it's a little rich to complain about going home. We could stay here and watch you vote against every single other appropriations bill. We're going to continue negotiations during the August recess to make sure we get back to funding the priorities of the nation. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, when I talk about funding the priorities of the nation, let's talk about our nation's defense as we just funded our nation's veterans. Let's get back to funding things that actually help our military focus on the threats from China, not teaching hatred of America from within. Yes, we defunded that. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to do our job 
through the next weeks and months, we invite all to come to work like we have come to work to try to come to an agreement, not just to vote no, but to come to an agreement to solve these problems, to pass these bills. If both sides won't, we still will do that work. And I would yield one more time to the gentlelady. Be in order. Mr. Speaker, the House is not in order. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Are those even more strikeable? The gentlelady from Massachusetts is recognized. Mr. Leader, we are going to continue to stand in this country for some basic principles. That we are sent here for the American people. That we are sent here to defend their freedom. That we are sent here to grow an economy that isn't just for the wealthy and well-connected, but is for the American family. That's the work we're doing. That is the basis of the great economic news coming out. And we are going to continue that fight. We hope that you will say no to extremism, to hatred, to bigotry that is put into these appropriation bills and say yes to solutions and fairness for the American people and to build an economy where they can see themselves. Funding our government is our basic job. The comments from the GOP conference about how we could go into a MAGA shutdown and it wouldn't matter are outrageous. The last time we had a shutdown, it was $11 billion out of this economy. And don't talk to us about standing for veterans when the GOP was the ones that have cut veterans' housing has cut their health care, has said to our women, our active women, vet, vet, military women, said it is okay to ask our military women to Be fight. In order. You have said to our active duty women that it is okay to fight for freedom for our country, but we are going to take your freedom away. That is not okay. I yield back. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Once again, Mr. Speaker, interesting that on the other side would talk about cutting health care benefits when we just had a bill to fund health care benefits to the tune of $138 billion and every Democrat voted no. We passed the bill with Republican votes. We will continue to do our work. We'll continue standing up to the extremists on the left who want to bring our country to a socialist direction with lies and misrepresentations. We heard it. They said that cut benefits would be cut. We just passed a bill that strengthened those benefits. They voted no, so maybe that means they wanted to cut those benefits. We didn't. We stood in the brink and we voted to support our veterans. We're going to continue negotiations during this work period to keep working to get the job done, to work for the people that sent us here, not to work for the people who want to change this country to something that is unrecognizable in socialist nations. Let's stand up for America. Let's keep getting the job done. We have more work to do. I yield back. As the leader has said, this impeachment is based on no evidence of wrongdoing by President Biden. But it's all the evidence we need to show that Kevin McCarthy has lost control of the gavel. With this announcement today, he has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Republican conference is controlled by conspiracy theorists, devoid of reasonable voices that are coming here to govern and solve problems. Donald Trump is the ultimate puppet master. Marjorie Taylor Greene is calling the shots. They ignored their constituents and they have purged their ranks of anyone who could call themselves a moderate. If there were moderates left, where are they? Why haven't they demanded a vote? Why haven't they come out and called this a distraction, a gross political stunt? Why? Because mega extremists are running the house. 
Six weeks ago, Kevin McCarthy sent the House home without a plan to keep the federal government open for business. Now we have just days to fund the government for the American people. But instead of getting to work, instead of thinking about the brave firefighters who need to get paid as they battle wildfires across this country, our heroic troops who deserve a paycheck for their service, the communities that need disaster aid, the seniors that depend on government service, he has launched a sham impeachment inquiry rooted in baseless, discredited lies. There is no evidence, none. And when Republicans are asked about it, they dance around the question. So what's the origin story of today's announcement? January 3rd, when the extremists dangled the speakership in front of Kevin McCarthy and he sold out. Those extremists have pushed us to the edge of economic disaster with the manufactured default crisis. When we came together in an agreement to save our economy before the ink was even dry, McCarthy once again succumbed to pressure and reneged. Then he sent us home for six weeks, just having passed one of 12 appropriation bills. And now here we are. Just days ago, he vowed to hold a vote for an inquiry. But the leaders of the MAGA Republican Conference are not here to serve the American people or improve their lives or brighten their future. There is no agenda except chaos and division. And they are only interested in advancing MAGA extremism. But whatever distractions they manufacture, Democrats are here to do our jobs. We are here to grow the economy by growing the middle class, and that's what we'll continue to do. And now I yield to our incredible caucus chair, Pete Aguilar. My honor to yield to our distinguished whip, Catherine Clark. Thank you so much, Mr. Leader. And I want to join in taking a moment to honor and remember um, Senator Feinstein. And just wanted to add to her incredible legacy is also one as a role model to women. The first woman mayor of San Francisco, part of the 1992 Year of the Woman, and someone who has really smashed ceilings, broken ground uh, for those of us who get to follow and stand on her shoulders. And what a contrast to that legacy of service to what we're witnessing in the House today. Another wasted day on voting on an extreme right-wing bill with zero chance of becoming law. Another day of fighting among the MAGA Republicans. Another day wasted talking about deficits while failing to take up the bipartisan agreement we already entered into that would reduce the deficit by one and a half trillion dollars. So now weeks after political theater, we are one day from a disastrous Republican government shutdown. So let's take a moment to talk about the people who are truly at the center of this story. It's not Speaker McCarthy, it's not Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's not Matt Gates. it's the service members who will work without a paycheck. It's the firefighters who will be furloughed. It's the early educators who will have to leave their classroom. It's the moms and parents who will be left scrambling for childcare. The MAGA shutdown comes down to this. House Republicans have chosen extremism over everyday people. They've chosen abortion bans over baby formula. They've chosen teacher layoffs over the well-being of our students. They've chosen cuts to Social Security, cuts to Head Start, cuts to the VA, over a commitment to our continued economic recovery. The House has been hijacked by extremists obsessed with making life harder and more expensive for working people. It does not have to be this way. 
This impending disaster can still be averted if just a handful of Republicans would stop listening to Donald Trump, if just a few members would honor their oath of office and say enough is enough. It's not too late to work for our country and not against it. It's not too late to come back from the edge. It is not too late to pass a bipartisan continuing resolution and enact the agreement we reached and voted on back in May. But if House Republicans choose to inflict this needless pain, this needless chaos, if they choose to force the shutdown, I can tell you this, the American people know who's at fault and they are not going to forget that this was brought to us by extremists in the House GOP. And with that- Time. Gentlelady from Connecticut. I'm uh, proud to yield three minutes to the Democratic Whip, Congressman McClark. Gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. I thank the ranking member. We would, we've just received a 71-page bill that is about keeping open our federal government, something that Democrats have been pushing for months. We are asking for 90 minutes to be able to read this bill and come to the floor with an informed vote. That has been denied. We have serious trust issues. So at this point in time, I am making a motion to adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Mr. Chair, I ask for a call of the yeas and nays. Yeas and nays Wait, are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. Thank you. It is an honor to be here with our entire Democratic caucus, with our chairman, Pete Aguilar, and our nominee for Speaker of the House, Hakeem Jeffries. So what we're witnessing is that we have had nine months since January of chaos and two weeks of absolute paralysis. House Republicans have a choice on how to move forward. They can join us, the Democrats, and choose bipartisanship and allow common sense to win the day, or they can double down on the extremism that has ground Congress and this House to a halt. With their nomination, of Jim Jordan, they are choosing chaos. They are choosing even more gridlock, even more inaction in the time of immense and urgent challenges at home and abroad. Instead of choosing the American people, they are once again choosing Donald Trump. Pause and think about who 
they are rallying behind. Jim Jordan's own colleagues have called him a legislative terrorist. He has voted to ban abortion nationwide with no exceptions for rape or incest. He has voted to shut down the government and force our troops to work without pay. He has voted to gut Social Security and Medicare. He was directly involved in the right-wing coup that sought to overturn the 2020 election. At every single turn, Jim Jordan has prioritized politics, power, fear, division, and hate over the American people. He has used his committee gavel to advance right-wing conspiracies while undermining the very institution that he serves. And he will inflict even more harm if he is allowed to have the speaker's gavel. Every Republican who casts their vote for him is siding with an insurrectionist against our democracy. But here's the good news. I want to thank my colleagues, those assembled behind me and others who have been here standing with the American people. These are the leaders who are standing for a bipartisan way forward. These are the leaders that have allowed us tonight to stand between Jim Jordan and the speaker's gavel. Without their unity, without their commitment to the American people, the Republicans would have gone to the floor today and put an insurrectionist in the speaker's chair. House Democrats are united because we stand for those values. We stand for the values of the American people, and we work every day to make those ideals of liberty and equality and justice for all realities. We believe in the reasons that we were sent here. We believe in raising the voices who don't often have them in the, in the halls of power here in Congress. That is our unity, and that is why we are going to stand together behind someone who always puts the American people first, and that's our nominee for speaker, Hakeem Jeffries. And now I am proud to introduce our caucus chair, an incredible leader for the people, Pete Aguilar. From Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 212, it's a New York area code. And it's our call for a speaker of integrity, intelligence, and inclusion. 212 is our call for a speaker who will protect our children, our veterans, our planet. 212 is our call for a speaker who will grow the middle class, lower costs, create good paying jobs, and make health care affordable. 212 is our call for a speaker who will secure liberty, justice, and opportunity for everyone. Well, the unanimous call of 212 House Democrats has been answered by our nominee for speaker, the gentleman from Brooklyn, the leader of our House Democratic Caucus, the Honorable Hakeem Jeffries. Leader Jeffries has answered our call, but the majority's nominee is disconnected. Disconnected from the American people and their values. MAGA extremism is designed to divide, and it has broken 
the Republican Party. Their nominee's vision is a direct attack on the freedom and the rights of the American people, and he's got the record to prove it. The Republican nominee has voted against health care for children, for veterans, even for 9-11 survivors. He has opposed lowering the cost of insulin repeatedly. He wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. Don't take it from me. It was raised on the other side of the aisle just this week as a selling point to make him speaker. Over his 16 years in the House, the Republican nominee has never supported a farm bill. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means he has turned his back on farmers, on rural communities, and the 11 million children who go to bed hungry in this country. The Republican nominee wants a national abortion ban with no exceptions for rape, incest, or the health of a mother. We want to make our own health care decisions in consultation with our families, our doctors, our faith, not with Jim Jordan. The Republican nominee plotted to overturn the 2020 election, traffics in misinformation, and is a true threat to our democracy and our Constitution. I have had the privilege of working here in the People's House for almost 10 years. And I've gotten to know many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And I know that you hear the same thing that I do. The American people expect us to work together on their behalf. It is not too late for the majority to choose a bipartisan path forward to reopen the House. Take yes for an answer. Every day, every day, the majority chooses to engage in a Republican civil war that is threatening their own members instead of engaging with us in the work of the American people is a day that weakens this institution and the standing of our country. We need a speaker who will govern through consensus, not conflict. We need a speaker worthy of wielding that gavel, a leader who will defend democracy, not degrade it. More than ever, we need proven, patriotic, people-first leadership. And that is why I am proud to nominate Hakeem Jeffries as Speaker of the House. Thank you.